Welcome, everybody. I'm, I think I know a lot of you, not all of you. I'm Mary Jane Esplin. I'm the Vice Chair of Equity and Mentorship. And I'm delighted that I'd heard, I just told him I'd heard a lot about this talk. Um, his name kept coming up for this talk. This whole area of rejection is just really important. And I've been in many of the mentorship groups and it's come up in the clinician scientist group. It's come up in the PhD group. It's come up in um, uh, some of the other groups too, because this really is important for everybody's academic role in quality improvement folks, clinician teachers and so forth. I'll do a brief introduction. I know a lot of you know Peter, but maybe not all of you know his extensive background. Um, until more, fairly recently, October, Dr. Uh, Peter was, Dr. Satamara was the Chief of Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative between CAMH and the Hospital for Sick Kids at UT. And he's been many, many years in the field of child and youth psychiatry and has an area focused on ADHD, disruptive behavior disorders, depression and anxiety, and so forth. He's also known you know, quite a lot for his work in uh, autism, his extensive research and collaborations around the world. Currently though, he has a new role. He's the director of the Cundale Center for Child and Youth Depression at the Center of Addiction and Mental Health, which is a research center that's dedicated to research dissemination and global leadership now in the field of youth and depression, uh, child youth and depression. So, he also still co-leads the, the Precision Child and Youth Mental Health Initiative at the Hospital for Sick Kids. And a lot of you know, he was former leader at McMaster University. And just recently in 2021, he was elected as a fellow at the Royal Society of Canada for his contributions in youth and mental health. So I have to tell you that I have been chairing a working group on mentorship and they really played a key role in the design, our implementation. This is a huge undertaking for our department, it's new and there are many moving parts. And I've gotten to know Peter very well through that and he's just been an excellent contributor and he is just a star mentor and really believes in mentorship. So I'm looking forward, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Peter. We're all looking forward to your talk and your pearls of wisdom and thank you again. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Jane, for those kind words and that kind um, introduction. And um, yeah, this is a talk that's uh, uh, very close to my heart and I'm always happy to give it and to hear about other people's experiences and, and their feedback. Next slide, Danica, please. So I'd like to cover four things. Uh, you know, to talk a little bit about how to cope with rejected grants and papers and promotion and proposals. We're all submitting something somewhere for others' approval. And so rejection is a pretty common aspect of academic life. So I want to draw some lessons from my vast experience with rejection. I'd like to offer some suggestions on how to improve your success rate whatever you're trying and attempting to do within your academic career. And also I'm gonna end on putting papers and grants in perspective with respect to the success of an academic career. Next slide. So I've got four key messages in dealing with rejection. The first one is shit happens in an academic career get used to it. Forgive me for using the expletive, but there's no better way to put it. Rejection does not build character. It's not like a cold shower according to going to boarding school, uh, but it does encourage reflection and humility. And I think these two are very useful traits in an academic career. It also does lead to a better project, a better paper, a better proposal, a better promotion portfolio, whatever. And it's important to remember that rejection is not a comment on your potential or on how smart you are. After all, you would have not got this far if you didn't have a lot of potential and if you weren't really, really smart. So I think that's really important to remember to not personalize any rejection. Next slide. It's interesting, a new book has come out that I found really, really interesting in praise of failure, four lessons in humility. Now, 
this takes more of a literary and philosophical approach to failure uh, and uh, humiliation. Uh, not so much about an academic career, but it is a very interesting read. Next slide. So, you know, face it, the odds are against you. One of the reasons I like baseball so much as a sport uh, is because it's a, a sport all about failure, about missing something. You know, as a batter, you're a star if you get three hits out of 10. The success rate in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, for example, is less than 35%. To biological psychiatry, it's less than 15%. For uh, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, NARSAD, the success rate is less than 25%. At our own CIHR, it varies, but it's around 12.5%. NIMH, the success rate is roughly 10%. So those are pretty high odds. So the odds are against you. I think one of the points I want to make is that these are odds at one point in time, but not over time. So in other words, the success rate goes up over time the more you reapply, resubmit something. So grit and perseverance are really important messages um, <clears throat> in an academic career. You need to have grit. You need to have perseverance. Next slide. So I've got five stages of rejection. So there's the finding out stage, there's anger, reflection, acceptance and commitment, and then resolution. And I'm going to go over these five stages now. So next slide. So finding out. Well, read the email in private. I will never forget. Um, in my uh, uh, specialty exam for psychiatry many, many, many years ago, they used to give us the results of the exam. You know, this was done in person. Next, previous slide, this. And uh, they would give us the results in a letter. And so we all went into the, at least the males went into the male washroom. And if you passed the psychiatry exam, you came out. And I'll never forget, one of my colleagues didn't come out Poor guy is still stuck there, I'm sure. So read the email in private. Don't read it at the end of the day. It can be a sleep disruptor. If the news is bad, turn off the computer. Think of something else. Go for a walk. Have a glass of wine. Talk to a loved one. I find preferably talking to somebody under five years of age is the best. Most important, don't make any decisions. Get on with the normal routine of life and come back to the rejection letter sometime later. Next slide. It's really important to understand the feedback that you get on the paper, on your grant, on your promotion, on your proposal. Talk to a committee member, that's fine. What was the committee like? really important to read between the lines. There's always a hidden review in addition to the review that you see on the page. Don't read too much into the scores and the ranking. The test retest reliability of peer review is pretty poor. I've, I've had the experience of going last in a grant review competition, ranking at the very bottom to at the next competition, ranking at the very top with very little change in the actual grant. It's important to do a critical appraisal of the rejection letter. There'll always be a summary. Was the summary accurate? Was there a misunderstanding? Remember, most of the reviewers, whether it's promotion or a grant or a paper, will be non-experts in your field. So the potential for misunderstanding is quite high. Are there legitimate differences of opinion between you and the reviewer? Maybe that difference of opinion extends to bias. My point is, don't get depressed, get angry. Oh my God, how could that reviewer be so stupid and not read the grant properly, not understand that such and such means such and such? I can't believe that they would be so short-sighted and stupid under the circumstances. 
Next slide. You know what? There are a lot of reasons to get angry at peer review. It is a very context-driven, uh, I'm not going to say sport, but activity. Those of you who have been in you know, peer review uh, 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 settings know there's a big difference between junior reviewers and senior reviewers. It's the junior reviewers who are really, really tough. Senior reviewers tend to be much more gentle and forgiving. There's difference between expert and non-expert reviewers. Uh, non-expert reviewers tend to be tougher than expert reviewers. There's the whole issue about the use of externals. One of the most interesting things about peer review is the time of day that your grant or your pay uh, that your grant this re would refer to gets reviewed, because at the beginning of a in the morning, the reviewers have not had time to calibrate their responses against each other. So the difference between reviewers is much greater in the morning. And at the very end of the second day, there's more consensus around. So if you're at the beginning, that can be a real problem. I don't know if I made this up or if somebody said this, but peer review is only marginally better than throwing grants papers, promotion dossiers, whatever, down the stairs and seeing which one lands where. It's a little better than that, but sometimes not much. Next slide. There's also a, an analogy between grant reviewers and theater critics. I've taken these quotations from the Oxford book of humorous quotations and translated the theater critic into the grant reviewer. So the grant reviewer has the unenviable task of drowning other people's kittens. Or that sound on a Sunday morning is the grant reviewer barking up the wrong tree. So when you get a rejection, remember these quotes. Next slide. Okay, 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 okay. After you get angry, think about it. Maybe there's something to it after all. Maybe I didn't communicate properly. I wasn't clear. Maybe I left something important out. Maybe there are fatal errors of methodology. Something that I think is all too common these days is that the idea is too complex. It's too complicated for a paper. Try, people try and put too much into a paper. They try and put too much into a grant. The more you try and stuff in, the more you leave yourself open to criticism. So there's a sweet spot between complexity and parsimony in a paper and in a grant. Another thing I find really important is, do you have a theory of change for your paper, for your grant? Does your theory make sense? It's really important to have that as a background. Is the topic important? Are the results likely to change clinical practice or theory in some way. Next slide. I really like this paper by uh, John Ioannidis. He, a bit iconoclastic, um, this guy, but he writes really neat papers and very thoughtful. He's got this paper that I think um, has caused a lot of stir, why most clinical research is not useful. And he makes the point that blue sky research, which is more fundamental basic research, cannot easily be judged on the basis of impact. But clinical research is different and should be useful. That's the sine qua non of clinical research. It's usefulness. And then he goes through all these features that make clinical research useful. Next slide. And I'm not going to go through these in detail, but these are the points that he raises in that paper as to what makes for a clinically useful paper, project, proposal, vision, whatever. You know, is the health problem that's important enough to fix? The context, has the prior evidence been systematically assessed to inform the need for new studies? Is the proposed study large and long enough to be sufficiently informative? Does it reflect real life? If it deviates, does this matter? Is it patient-centered? Is there value for money? 
Is it feasible? And only at the end does he identify methods, data, and analysis verifiable and unbalanced. It's all the other things that are important when you're evaluating the usefulness and utility of clinical research. And I think we pay too much attention to the bottom criterion and not enough to the others at the top. Next slide. So reflection, what do you do next? Well, it's really important to rely on the advice of a mentor or your study team. Everybody needs a mentor. This is why I'm so grateful that Mary Jane's taken this leadership on. I don't care what academic rank you have, if you're a lecturer or if you're a full professor, you need to have a mentor. I have a mentor. I have several mentors that I go to whenever important issues come up. It's really important to reflect on fundamentally is the basic idea a good one? Is it useful? How easy is it to fix the identified problem? Resubmission of the grant is really worthwhile. My rule is you got four chances to submit the grant before giving up. And I don't give up on a paper. You can always get a paper published. The question you have to ask yourself is whether it's worth it. it takes a lot of time to work on a paper after it's been rejected. A lot of time to work on a grant proposal. You have to ask yourself whether it's worth it. For papers, people are too, too, too um, likely to go low in the impact factor after they've been rejected. Sometimes a, a journal with a higher impact factor likes your paper better because they've got smarter reviewers. You're more likely to get accepted at a higher impact journal. So. The message here is to take time to reflect on when to hang on, when to let go, and how to know the difference. I'm pretty sure there's a song written about that, but I can't remember who the composer was. If anybody can, put it in the chat. Next slide. Okay, next stage is acceptance and commitment to change. So I'm a big believer in uh, uh, acceptance and commitment. Next slide. <clears throat> so the resubmission, this is an opportunity to respond to the review. And I suggest, and I go, when I get a rejection, I go over each point in detail. I quote the criticism in italics. I admit my mistakes. It's really important to admit your mistakes, even if it wasn't really a mistake. It's still important to admit the, the mistake. Thank you, Kenny Rogers. <laughs> That's right. It was in context of poker. Good for you, Lisa. Thank you. Admitting your mistake. So, but on the other hand, don't be afraid to challenge the reviewer's mistakes or misconceptions. Totally legitimate to do that. And the reviewer will, re will respect you if you challenge their misconception. I always focus most of all on the editor of the journal who's responded to me. Make sure you get those comments above all. The scientific officer at CIHR who has synthesized everybody's comments in the room at that grant review uh, uh, point. So that's, those are the comments to really focus on and make sure you, um, you address. So again, important to read between the lines. There is a hidden review <clears throat> behind the review that you're actually reading. And trying to address what that hidden review is in a larger context is important. Next slide. So the resubmission, as I say, the acceptance rate goes up. So at CIHR, the acceptance rate for the first resubmission is 25%, so a lot better than the 12% the first time around. So don't be discouraged. The resubmission may well go to at least one of the same reviewers, but it'll also go to a new reviewer. The resubmission won't go to the same two or three reviewers it did before. They'll always try and get a new reviewer. 
the the uh, the grant and the journal reviewers will now have a copy of your previous reviews. So when you respond to the review, they'll be able to check the extent to which you addressed the most important problems. You have a relationship with the reviewer. The reviewer, when you're when you've been rejected and you got the resubmission, the reviewer often feels guilty. They feel bad that they've hurt you. They don't want, especially if you're an early career researcher, there's less guilt the more senior you are, but if you're early on, they're gonna feel guilty. On the other hand, the reviewer doesn't wanna look stupid and doesn't wanna be ignored. So regardless of your feelings, it's really important to be respectful but challenge where appropriate. For the most part, the more you change, the greater the, cha the chance of acceptance. So don't be reluctant to move, change things even in a big way. Next slide. The literature review. This is really, really important in a grant review. It's in, in, a, in when you're writing a grant or writing a paper, you have to tell a story. There are the bad guys, which is the other scientists in the field, and there are the good guys, you and your team. There has to be a conflict. There has to be a focus of disagreement. What don't we know? And there has to be a happy ending, which is your solution to the disagreement. I can't tell you the number of times reading, being a grant reviewer or a paper reviewer, when they haven't done a systematic review. So don't summarize only your own work. Don't cherry pick studies. Do a systematic review in your literature review and end up with the evidence gaps that are important and make sure that your design of the paper or the grant addresses those evidence gaps. And it's okay to admit that not all the issues can be tackled in one project or in one paper. Next slide. And then the other thing is I always start a grant with the impact paragraph. People leave the significance and impact to the very end. That's the wrong thing to do. You should start with significance and impact. Visualize what you hope your overall impact paragraph will say. Your idea and the science behind it should make a big difference in what we know or how we do things. Often we spend enormous effort writing a proposal, outlining a solid experimental approach that will only lead to incremental advancement. It won't gen generate much enthusiasm in a reviewer. You have to capture the reviewer's imagination. And I can't emphasize this enough, scholarship is a work of the imagination. It's not dry science by itself. It is an act of imagination where you are making a proposal for the future. You're telling a story. It's got to grip the reviewer. It's got to be interesting. And that you do by storytelling and imagination. So uh, it's really important, I think, to remember that. Next slide. Well, okay, so we got over the that part. We're now into the resolution part. And how does this rejection fit into your academic career as a whole? <clears throat> For those of us who, who do research or scholarship, it's really important to have your research program in view. You have a proposal, a project, that's one thing, but there you have a vision, you have a research program in review and your project is one part of that vision, that program. So important to distinguish the project from the program. So you should have a variety of different projects on the go and papers at one time. You need to diversify, you have to have a diversified portfolio. It should all be consistent within your overall vision and your program, but don't just work on one thing and push that to the end. Always have other things because you need to work on multiple 
scholarship projects at one time. All these different projects should logically fit with each other and they should build towards your legacy project. So what do you want written on your gravestone? Peter Zotmari was a dis discovered or tried to discover the genes for autism and it didn't work, you know, something like that. The more times you play, the more chances you have to win. It is a lottery to a certain extent. The more feedback you get, the better the project. Up to a point though, you can get too much feedback where you know the incremental value just starts to lose and the curve kind of flattens out. One thing I think that young, you know, early career researchers should avoid is not to resubmit if it's not ready. This is a problem with CIHR where there's such a short timeline between getting the rejection and the resubmission date. Not a lot of time to fix it, the grant. So don't feel under pressure to put it in. And don't, uh, you know, if it's not ready, don't put it in. It's not worth it to say, oh, I wanna see what kind of score I get the second time around. Really make it as good as you can, as you possibly can, because the reviewers, will lose patience if there's not significant improvement the next time around. Next slide. Now, it has, it will happen to you that there'll be re repeated rejection. And what should you do? And here's where I sort of, I, I think about the person, the place and timing. Are you the right person in the right place at the right time for this research program, for this scholarship program. It's important to reflect upon yourself. Do you have the passion for this? You know, do you have the, enough of a focus on what you want to accomplish? Do you see yourself a disruptor or an incrementalist? These are on a spectrum. A disruptor is somebody who does scholarship and makes a big change at one point, whereas an incrementalist is somebody who's happy with smaller changes over time. I'm an incrementalist. I think there are fewer and fewer disruptors in health research at this point in time. Very hard to be a disruptor. I think it's better to be an incrementalist. But what are you attempting to do? Are you in the right place? Do you have the support? Do you have the protected time? to accomplish what you want? Do you have the right mentor? I think we need multiple mentors over time. Sometimes we outgrow mentors and it's important to say thank you. You know, we've had a great relationship, but I think because I'm learning new things now, I think I need support and help from somebody else. Does the place where you're working have patience for you? And I think this is a real challenge for early career researchers where the academic leadership is not very patient. They're not, you know, they want to see immediate results right away. And it takes a long time for some people in certain fields to get to that point where they get their first CIHR grant funded, they get their first paper published in a good journal. Another issue is timing. You could be too smart. You could be too early in that field's development. Your ideas can be way ahead of the rest of the field. You may be right, but the rest of the field isn't there and you, th there isn't, the ground isn't fertile for you. You may be too late in a field. You may not be ready. You may not have the skills. So timing's really impor important. <clears throat> My point here is, it's not you as a person, it's the fit between you and the place you're working and the time of the field. So it's a complex interaction, which is why one must never take rejection as a personal statement, but as a manifestation of fit. And I've always reflected on my career every three years, between three and five years, I sit down during the summer 
overlooking a lake somewhere with my loved one and I reflect on my career, is this where I want to be? Am I doing the right thing? Do I need to learn some new things? Do I need to give up some old things? What should I do for the next three years? I don't think we take enough time reflecting on the fit we have with our context and environment. Next slide. <clears throat> and I think this, this has, I wanna say something about the impact of, of scholarship. Um, you know, um, as an academic institution uh, and the various hospitals I've worked at, there's way too much focus on the metrics of scholarship, H index, Scopus, whatever, et cetera. You know, there are these two really important documents and um, I wanna make sure you're aware of them. There's DORA, the, Dec the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment and the Leyden Manifesto. Both of these really important documents in health research field, and they highlight how flawed research metrics are and how important it is to focus on impact and on scientific merit. And the final irony is that the more impactful the paper, the less it's cited in the long term. And I want to give you an example of this. I think, I bet most of you that are with us, with me today, have heard the phrase, one in five children in Ontario have a mental health disorder, right? Everybody's heard that? I bet you, you have not a clue who the first author of the paper, of that paper is. If you know who it is, put it in the chat. That is, Everybody knows that state one in five kids have a mental health disorder. Everybody's forgotten who wrote the paper and what the study is. I bet. Does anybody know? It, well, Nicole, of course you would know because you're, <laughs> you're a child and, a, and youth psychiatrist. But yes, but you know the author. Can't remember the first author. Anybody know the first author? See, that's my point. We forget, it. the more you know, the, the more something's part of the conversation, the less you remember who the author is. So their H index is declining over time. It was Dan offered. So Harriet and I, Dan was a mentor to Harriet and I. Harriet's with us today, I think still. And uh, Dan uh, was the first author of the Ontario Child Health Study that Harry and I had the great fortune to, um, to be a part of. Next slide. And my final bit of advice is that this is supposed to be fun. This academic career that you've embarked on is supposed to be fun. It's about the joy of discovery. It's about working with people you really enjoy collaborating with. It's about making a difference in the lives of those suffering from mental disorders. And there are few greater privileges than that. And I'll leave you with that final thought. Mary Jane, thank you. <laughs>